to Charles Stewart, who is a professor of anthropology at University uh, College London. Um, um, Charles Stewart has conducted research. You, you, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so Char uh, Charles has con uh, conducted uh, ethnographic uh, research in mostly in in, uh, in Greece, mainly on in Naxos, uh, the Cycladic island of Naxos, and um, his central topics are in 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 his books are dreaming, uh, Orthodox Christianity, anthropology of history. So both very very ethnographic and, and more theoretical contributions. And uh, I would like to mention his uh, three publications, Demons and the Devil, Moral Imagination in Modern Greek Culture, published in, uh, at, at Princeton University Press in 1991. And very important for our uh, workshop, Dreaming and Historical Consciousness in Island Greece uh, in 2012. And he also uh, co-edited varieties of historical experience that came up in 2019, and Charles Stewart is currently working on a study of historicity, an anthropological perspective, and uh, it's uh, it's a, it's a ju juxtaposition or connection between comparative ethnography and philosophy on, of history. And today, uh, uh, Charles is going to talk about uh, dream, a dream notebook from Naxos from 1934, Local Orthodox Christianity and Eternity. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, how will I move the slides? Will you do that? Uh, okay. I have eight, I have that's all right. It's no problem. I have eight slides. <laughs> Maybe that's what do. You do it by yourself, I can pass it to both of you. No, okay. it's really not that. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> as the predominant, at least statistically, uh, religion in Ukraine <clears throat> is Eastern Orthodox Christianity, I thought my um, reflections on Eastern Orthodox Christianity in another country, Greece, uh, would be relevant for this uh, workshop. My data. I wish I already gave away half of the first page of my talk. <laughs> I did come from uh, Naxos, the Cycladic island in Greece, uh, which is predominantly Orthodox Christian, although it does have, uh, it was um, ruled by the Venetians, so it has a Catholic presence, so it's not exclusively Orthodox in another way in which it resembles Ukraine, perhaps. Um, so I speak to you as an anthropologist. Uh, it was supposed to show up on my original title slide. It's a Charles Stewart Department of Anthropology. <laughs> uh, but that part didn't come through. It was a bit unstable, and that's not your fault. <laughs> uh, but my identity as an anthropologist is somewhat unstable uh, between anthropology and history, maybe. Uh, but I wanted you to know, so I, I, I know that anthropology is not the predominant discipline in this room, and history might be. Uh, that uh, I speak within the methodological disciplinary framework of anthropology. So that will help you to bear that in mind as you listen to me. At the same time, I am uh, completely fascinated by history and I am working on a long-term project on the anthrop to do the anthropology of history, mm -hmm. uh, which is the anthropological uh, approach uh, to retrieving uh, the way in which people in different places understand and represent the past, especially when they don't conform to historicism, the normal operating system <clears throat> that most of you uh, go by. Mm -hmm. So my enterprise is this combination of ethnography and philosophy of history. And I'm great looking forward to dialoguing with you, obviously, um, with the historians, with specialists in psychology and psychotherapeutics, and any other, all the other participants in this workshop. <clears throat> uh, the history of the present. I was so just excited when I when I took that on board. I think it's a wonderful idea. Uh, there's a proverb in Greek, and that says, 
whoever dips their finger into honey and doesn't lick it, <laughs> <laughs> which is to say, if you're collecting the history, uh, you know, for posterity, you're creating the archive of future stories. Mm -hmm. How could you not dip your finger in and start to write that history already yourself? <laughs> anyway, I find it fascinating, and it's another area for collaboration uh, between our two disciplines, uh, history and anthropology. We've had uh, anthropology and history. We've had public history, which is not a fascinating uh, endeavor. We've had ethno history, historical anthropology, and so on. So this is another collaborative one for us. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Oh, anthropology. Oh. Yeah. I told you. <laughs> so I'm going to be discussing the dreams of one Marcos Capiris, and there you see him pictured. And Oprah, it's a little different, you know, I've got the actual pictures of the guy. Um, he was born on Naxos, and at the age of 21, he migrated to California for work. So around the you know, early 1900s. And this photo might date from that period. Around 1912, he returned from America to fight in the First Balkan War. And after that, he married a woman from the high mountain, Naxos mountain village of Koronos, where I do, I've done ethnographic research. I've spent a lot of time there. And he had seven children, he's a father of seven children. And he ran a successful business trading tobacco, petrol, uh, and petroleum, because he played kerosene and other things, and uh, dynamite. That might I have to say that Coronos sits atop the world's highest quality deposits of the heavy stone emery, which is used in grinding metals. It's very important in the war industry, and it's also used for, for nail parts. That's why you call them emery or sometimes. And the miners had needed dynamite to blast into the, into the rock. So emery was quite literally a booming business around World War I and in the years after World War I. Now, um, the next slide, please. Capiris uh, bequeathed a dream notebook to posterity, and that's just a picture of the first page of it. Um, it contains nightly dreams and visions that he received as illuminations, that's his word, illuminations, from the Virgin Mary, known as the Panagia in Greek, but I'll stick to Virgin Mary for its recognizability to you. Uh, the dreams from the Virgin Mary and others and things. The text reports dreams beginning in November 1934 and ending in 1937 uh, when the text was compiled. It was compiled all in one hand, one handwriting, and it was obviously done from notes or memory. So the dreams on the you know particular moments were probably kept on on pages of paper or just remember in 1937. Um, Pyrrhus himself was only semi-literate. Uh, his wife, Athena, compiled this, this, this manuscript on his behalf. Note the very neat handwriting. Uh, it's in formalistic Greek. It's basically a self-published book entitled Holy Visions. That's the title uh, that they're saying this has in this prologue. And it's basically a self-published book. Uh, it's, it reminds me of a church prayer book in the way that the handwriting is done, a little bit Byzantine style. Uh, it's, of its, it's, it's, it's a self-published book of its time. Uh, today, it would have like a copyright symbol on it and it would be maybe published on Amazon or something. <clears throat> So one of the goals of this workshop is to investigate dreams during wartime, dreams during extreme crisis. And Koronos, between 1934 and 1937, was not in extreme crisis. Uh, and I'll bear that in mind as I explore this text um, in relation to the workshop theme. His dreams of... Uh, his dream book begins with a description of grief and melancholia <clears throat> besetting Capiris and especially his wife, especially Athena, over the loss of a 10-month-old child that she bore. 
clearly, and Athena is writing this notebook, clearly she's writing in this prologue part, not just recording her husband's narrative. And she describes her sorrow just spiraling down to rock bottom. And she says, as it really, she did hit bottom in her depression. She writes, quote, it was at this point that the strange things began to happen to my husband. And that's the prologue to the 70 pages of Dreams and Visions. Now, a lot of strange things do happen in Kapiri's book. And I, if I took you into the details of it, you would be so confused and so lost. I can't do that. Um, I'll just give a summary overview of the whole arc of this 70 pages. Mm -hmm. Papyrus is singled out for visitations by the holy figures uh, of the church, Christ, Mary, the saints. They invest him with a cross. This is like a talisman amulet. It's very uh, frequent to see, um, and it's very frequent in the dream, in, in, the, in the kind of body of dream narratives that I've collected. It's like analyzed more dreams than just Papyrus. It works as a kind of phylactery. Um, so it wards off evil, and it especially wards off a class of demons called Thelonia in, the, in their writing. Their accentuation is always different from my accentuation. I have a tendency to hypercorrect as a scholar who was at I study classics first. Mm -hmm. uh, but Thelonia means all demons in this narrative, but it particularly means a category of demons that rove about in the air. An example would be the souls of unbaptized infants shades of their own child, right? Mm -hmm. um, basically, the restless dead who wander mm -hmm. the airwaves mm -hmm. and bear malice. Now, I worry sometimes, uh, and I always said this, that I bring in too much theology and, and uh, philology. And I did write a whole book on the subject of demons and the local Orthodox Christianity. We're dealing here with folk orthodoxy. It doesn't always match up with theology. And my scholastic insistence on the aerial quality of the Telonia, because that's really, I think, you know, historically, philologically, they are air spirits, um, is relevant because Kapiris is consistently in the air. His dream books, he's constantly flying. And I'll say more. What's he doing up there? The majority of his dreams involve saints appearing and whisking him away to visit the site where buried icons were discovered on a hillside near the village 100 years ago. Sometimes they take him underground, where he converses with an undiscovered icon of St. Anne, and he also sees 18 further buried icons. More often, however, he is on a tour of the cosmos, the universe. The saints take him there by various means of transportation, Angels come and bear him aloft. He rides a cloud. Another time, a threshing floor uh, transports him. Can I have the next slide? There's a picture of a threshing floor. Um, this abounded circular space, analogous to a, a magic carpet, you know, in a way. This is kind of like the Thousand and One Nights uh, meets the Apocalypse of St. John in the local, local theology. Um, in other dreams, he rides a lift, you know, an elevator. In Greek, the word is ascenseur. <laughs> so he's got the completely modern next to the, um, you know, the, the uh, completely Middle Eastern folkloric. Um, then there was one of the most enigmatic terms in the text for me. He rides a kubuklion, which I understood. I had to look this up. So I didn't know this term. It means a baldachin or a ciborium. And then my ignorance was completely you know, compounded because I didn't even know what the definitions of the word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can I have the next slide? Um, having investigated, I think that uh, both of the English translation terms mean a covered, quite often canopied mm -hmm. space. An example being this canopy over the funeral bureau of Christ. Uh, from the 17th century embroidery in Asia Minor. And the next slide. Or, and 
uh, a canopy covering like this epitaphios, the funeral bier of Christ, which is taken around in procession, uh, this one around the church of Saints Constantine and Helen on Good Friday in Thessaloniki a couple of years ago. Um, so in either case, the Kabuklion is a circumscribed cube. You can think of it as some cubic space uh, that, that in Capri's dream scenarios could contain passengers and hurdle into space. Another vehicle that appears more than once for celestial travel is a marble ship and it has a marble ladder and measures 140 meters long. At one end of the boat, he sees a picture of Christ handle platform as if in the dome of a church. I imagine that it looks something like this picture, uh, except for the fact that Capiris described it as lacking a mast. This one is a cross on the top, you know, I just kind of saw it as a mast, but maybe it's just a kind of, um, you know, ambient random cross that, that uh, was drawn. This is a drawing from an earlier dream notebook by a young girl named Marina. And it, that put a bit of information on the slide. It said Marina was part of a group of dreaming children about 14 years old who cropped up in the village of Kornos, Kapiris village, four years before the beginning of his notebooks. And they dreamt on a nightly basis uh, that an icon of St. Anne would be dug up out of the ground. Hence, Capirius's ideas about the dream I said that he goes into the earth. He goes into the earth and into space and into earth is, well, both of those activities are completely consistent with the earlier corpus of dreams, which I was able to study from these 14 year old children <clears throat> a few years earlier. During, the, during 1930, the very year of Marina and the dreaming, uh, children's dreams. Uh, the village of Coronas sank into deep uh, financial, you know, economic depression, along with the rest of the world. They were uniquely vulnerable to the global uh, depression because they were not an agricultural village. They were dependent on the world economy to export their emery. So the depression just really completely decimated, it devastated the village. Now we're getting, you know, we're getting to a crisis here. <laughs> yeah. um, mm -hmm. And uh, during this crisis, these 14 year old uh, children with a few adults, can we show the next slide? That's a dream of an adult 40 year old Evdokia, uh, who was a little bit the ringleader, the kind of this, the school um, mistress organizer of the dreaming children. And the next slide. And that's a picture of uh, Marina's, one of Marina's notebooks, of which I have 40, mm -hmm. which I analyzed in my book on dreaming. And that's, Marina didn't always draw pictures in them, but she, this is the first one where she draws a picture. And what is she drawing a picture of? Cross, the same kind of talisman that uh, the Kapir is talking about that I, that I see. <clears throat> um, the book, Kapiris's book now, Holy visions can be understood as developing in intertextual heteroglossic relationship with the elaborate stories and imagery in the dream narratives of the children dreamers. Who told these children dreamers told of an icon of St. Anne buried at the place where miraculous icons had been found in the 1830s. So I can't go into all of that here. Upon recovery of the icon of the Saint Anne icon, should it be discovered, it was prophesied that other treasures, a very important word in these dream diaries, these are treasures, uh, treasures of gold, emery, and money would be found. And it was prophesied that Coronas would become a pilgrimage center, wealth from visitors would pour in. And not only would their economic crisis be solved, but their visions and their custodianship of icons and the pilgrimage would be testimony to their moral purity. I term this complex of ideas the myth dream, in which dream visions and their narrations cycle back and forth between dreaming and waking. Dreams directed waking actions, such as digging and fasting, religious fasts, 
while daytime events such as political suppression or the taunts of unbelievers <clears throat> figured into the dreams of success following days and weeks. Papyrus's dream book picks up all the main themes, especially the discovery of what he termed heavenly treasures, which is their blessing, the cross, the new icons, their, their spiritual moral purity, uh, and earthly treasures such as gold. And he writes about a gold statue of Ariadne. Remember Ariadne on Maxos. His dream book is a rep re reprise of the myth dream several years after it had last flared up. So this flared up in 1930 and 1931 and it died down. The myth dream of Koronos has been continuing like a smoldering peat fire beneath the surface for close to two centuries since 1830. Part of the intertextuality between the corpora of dreams to be found is is to be found in the affective domain. In 1930, the increasing immiseration brought by the Great Depression infused the children's dreams and the waking life of the village with a sense of impending doom and desperation. When Capiris borrows their voicing and their themes, coupled with Athena's preamble about their deceased baby, he replicates this atmosphere and steps into their anxiety. That's what I heard in your paper as well. The, the, the dreams during World War II were in fact a lot cited during World War I. It's this kind of historical analogy, uh, which is a transmission of affect uh, over time, a kind of historical consciousness in the key of emotion. Was the social and economic situation of Koronos at the time of his dreams and visions as dismal as that of 1930 or that of Ukraine today? Almost certainly not. But it is worth noting that dream researchers have observed that anxiety is the predominant emotion in all dreams and dreamers. I turn to Christianity as another prominent contextualizing feature of dreaming in Orthodox Christian communities. Christianity in general invites rupture, the opening of cracks in the shell of the mundane world through which eternity may be glimpsed. The important point about Eastern Orthodox eternity is that it exists alongside this world. It is not, as I always thought, a space that comes at the end of time after the world has been canceled. Eternity or paradise exists now, but in another dimension. Some think of eternity as outside of time, as not time, or as timeless. But in orthodoxy, eternity is another type of time, where everything that ever happened, everybody who ever lived, are available all at once. And they are not organized sequentially in linear order, as in historicism. Mm -hmm. Just purely to help you imagine this, um, purely for comparison, uh, Freud's description of the unconscious as having uh, has the same property of simultaneity. Events in the unconscious, in Freud's um, ultimate, for me, um, ultimate uh, pronouncement of it in Civilization Its Discontents, events in the unconscious do not sit in perfectly stratified ar architectural layering, ar archaeological layering. They form an untidy site where materials from all periods are juxtaposed. A postdoc in my department, uh, Nicholas Lackenby, conducted fieldwork in the Serbian market town of Kraljevo about five years ago. His interlocutors, who have lived through a fair amount of turbulence since the 1990s, spoke of being tired. The time is tiring. The Orthodox faithful advocated a liturgical life, the Orthodox faithful in Kraljevo, <laughs> that would bring them into relationship with eternity, which could give release perspective and allow reconfiguration of the everyday, of the fatigue. A passage in Kapiris' text converges on the view of the Serbian pious congregants, who were known as Vernici in uh, Serbia. One day in 1934, Capirius was illuminated by a saint, by her holy grace, 
who says to him, quote, let me tell you, my child, what a church is. The church represents paradise for this temporary world of people. And those who attend church, pray and follow the words of Christ. They go to eternal paradise and rejoice eternally and forever, unquote. In a dream of 28th of November, 1934, the Virgin takes Capiris to, to paradise where he sees a wide passage filled with people. All of them appear as 33 year olds, the same age as Christ when he died. Boarding a vessel analogous to the funeral bier of Christ or the canopied space where the Eucharist is prepared makes the sacra into a launching pad for propulsion to heaven. In one of the dreams where he ascends by that alternative modern means of an elevator, appearance reports passing through the heavens as if through the floors of an apartment block. On each ascending level, he sees higher and higher order saints and angels praying for the salvation of the world. His heaven is divided into seven, just like the medieval idea. Seventh heaven is the highest where Christ is. Conclude in conclusion then, we are looking at the conjunction between crisis and dreams, and I reflect on that in relation to thought of the Italian historian of religions and anthropologist Ernesto de Martini. Well, I have a friend here, Deborah Puccio, who is a fellow anthropologist and Italian. And I, I infer a, a, also an admirer of de Martino. So got her next to me. Uh, the English translation solved interest for this conference. Uh, of his posthumous work, The End of the World, uh, is soon to appear at the end of this year, uh, based on an entirely re-edited version of the manuscript left unfinished when he died in 1965. And he wrote it in the kind of, in the rough times of the Cold War, when people were building bomb shelters worried that they would be in uh, nuclear annihilation at any moment. And when he was facing uh, his own long uh, death of cancer, I believe. And, and he composed this. The full edition, our re edition of that text has already appeared in French and in Italian. And this is, unfortunately, the English one has been edited for, to keep the length down. <clears throat> As Ukraine has come under attack from Russia, fear has undoubtedly settled over the population. This is a crisis, and now that it's gone on for over a year, it is a perma crisis. That was Colin's Dictionary's Word of the Year for, 19, for 2022. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that many Ukrainians have been forced to contemplate, in one way or another, the end of the world. One may ask, along with De Martino, whether they frame it as an arbitrary annihilation without eschaton, De Martino's, without a kind of meta-historical narrative, narrative to do with God and salvation, arbitrary destruction, <laughs> bomb is going to fall on us. Or is an apocalypse with eschaton. And this is part of a divinely um, um, mandated narrative, the kind of will of God. How to convert an irrational secular decimation into a meaningful eschaton? In De Martino's model, what happens when one comes under threat is that one, an individual, is knocked out of history in what De Martino termed dehistorification, dehistorification. It converges on descriptions from psychology, which he drew on extensively. One seek, seeks to escape the train of events, the historicity, as I believe that is a kind of primary meaning number one in the dictionary, the word historicity, is the is kind of framework of unfolding eventuation. Um, you try to escape it, uh, escape it because it's inexorably leading to risk and distress. In the face of such trauma, one defense might be psychic flight, mm. where, no, where one no longer occupies one's own body and subjectivity, but detaches and watches from a safe distance or perhaps vacates altogether. Mm. A moment of eventuation has been edited out in De Martino's formulation, more or less, quote, one is in history as if one were not in it. The experience goes 
goes unclaimed to use uh, Kavita's term, and therefore psychologically unintegrated into the person. The quest for reintegration can be difficult. De Martino pointed to the therapeutic possibilities of religious reintegration, where rituals of the church and the assistance of holy figures, such as we see in Kapiri's dream narratives, may picture one's problems as already solved. At a meta-historical level, one will be 33 eternally united with friends and family. If dehistorification knocks one out of history, then the constructive journey into meta-history takes one even farther away. This is a paradox of De Martino's model. The trauma knocks you out of time, then you jump onto an even greater excursion out of time, to, like a period into the heaven. Um, and then the ritual practices involving the community bring one back and restore one to the world where the person may take up their historicity again. One of De Martino's examples is mourning rituals. Mm -hmm. He read a whole book on uh, death and mourning. For Serbia, my, my, um, my colleague at UCL Lackenby reported that funerals and memorial services were sacramental ritual moments when one could feel eternity as one prayed for loved ones who had died. In a war zone, attending such memorial, memorials, which in the Orthodox Church are frequent and important in the first year, may be a very common experience. So we can add that to everything. I've not been in Ukraine, but I just can imagine the number of memorial services going on. I conclude with the observation that dreaming also challenges, as, as I've said, we've said that um, crisis and trauma challenge the historicity of steady becoming from past into future. But I think dreaming challenges it as well. One's head may be on the pillow and the body may be trapped in time and space, but the complete experiential theater of the mind is in another world altogether for real, you know, because that's the quality of dreaming. The perceptual system is shut down in its uniquely real kind of imagination and sees, you know, many other uh, gradations of imagination. And it certainly exceeds the confines of historicism. Perhaps this is why Kapiri's, Kapiri's meta historical journeys, as well as those of the children of 1930 on Naxos, occurred during dreams. In disconnection from ordinary perception, dreams provide the perfect medium for meta-historical journeys, whose object is to, according to De Martino, and I would like to think as well, whose objective is to heal the present. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Charles. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to... Uh, give now a uh, space and time to Amy Haskell, who is an associate professor of history in the history department at, uh, of, Columbia, just, <clears throat> of Columbia University, and uh, where she's also chairing urban studies. Uh, Amy is a specialist uh, in modern Brazil, uh, sure. with a focus on urban and legal history, history of crime and policing, slavery and post-abolition societies. Uh, she has published um, a book about Brazil's clandestine lottery in the making of public life in Brazil called Laws of Chance, uh, edited the Rio de Janeiro Reader, and uh, she's now completing a book uh, entitled Rio de Janeiro, The Politics of Nightfall. Uh, and this book is talking about the history of the urban nighttime from the perspective of 19th century Rio uh, and um, on top of this, uh, she's also um, co-directing a, uh, a working group called Refugee Cities, Urban Dimensions of Forced Displacement. Uh, and maybe all this is interlinked, right? <laughs> in just one person. So the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And Mariana, I'll, I'll cue the slides there. I also, I don't have many of them. Um, as I often joke when I'm beginning talking about this project, I'm writing about a clandestine practice that happened in the dark in the 19th century. So I have to struggle to find images, but I, I usually don't do that. Um, but first I want to thank, um, I th thank you, Malgosha. Thank you, everyone, Boda and um, Mariana, Sophia, everyone who organized this. I'm just in awe that you were able to orchestrate such an interesting multinational in-person event. I'm really, really glad to be part of that. And I hope that I can contribute mm -hmm. somehow. I am definitely an odd person out in that I don't work on Europe at all. And um, I'm a historian, but my work has touched on the history of the nighttime. And as you'll see in this presentation, my the work that I'm going to be presenting on is really about um, not about reconstructing how people dreamt or how people remembered their dreams or even necessarily sleep, but the impossibility of really knowing that in my case and sort of what we can learn about that. And so I'm going to discuss my own ongoing research project on the history of the nighttime in 19th century Rio de Janeiro, which at the time was the capital of Brazil. And I want to start out by highlighting two things. First, the connection of sleep and dreams to the nighttime is something that we need to establish rather than to assume. Um, the subjects of my own research are mainly enslaved people who often had to steal moments of rest whenever they could. And so um, they slept in alleys and in the, on the kitchen floor and in back rooms and in public spaces and warehouses. And again, not always at night. Um, I also want to highlight the radical potential for the study of sleep and rest and the great political necessity of it and the opportunities for researchers and the humanities that it presents to connect to the sciences, to architects and planners and policymakers and activists. And this is something that I'll just suggestively raise at the end, and I'm sure it will be part of our of our conversation. And also, I'm going to focus a bit on sources and I'm also I really am so um, excited about this public history this public humanities project that you're working on. And so I'm in the middle of the process of writing a book about the urban nighttime in 19th century Brazil, um, primarily, as I said, on the city of Rio. And actually, uh, the long 19th century, as I'm calling it, slightly different in on this side of the on that side of the Atlantic. Um, which is a period that transects the periods before and after the introduction of artificial light, which is by design. And it also is a period that encompasses Brazil's first post-colonial century, which witnessed the massive rise and eventual end of African slavery there. So slavery started already in the early 1500s, but kind of counterintuitively, it had a massive rise in the, in the 19th century. The crux of the analysis in my book is the distinction between day and night. Using Rio de Janeiro, which was the South Atlantic's um, slave trading port, and, and as, as I said, newly independent Brazil's capital city as its geographical focus. Rio was under curfew for almost the entire 19th century. <clears throat> And it was also the, the, the principal port of the South Atlantic slave trade from Africa and the city with the most, with the largest number of enslaved people in the world. And so when I say I'm in the middle of the process, um, I've been working on this for so long, actually, it's been something like 12 years since I started this project, since I began this research, I'm embarrassed to say. Um, and since, in some, from the time that I started until now, a historiographical trend has risen up, up around me, and I keep discovering new people who are studying the, the what we call it, nightology or noitologia <laughs> in the Brazilian history context that I study. Um, what struck me those 12 years or so ago as a surprising observation that the night is just is not just astronomical, but also a socio-legal invention has also formed the foundation for a body of other scholarship on many other parts of the world. And it would be really difficult for me to summarize, obviously, all of this work, some of which many of you are familiar with, but we can definitely talk about it more during our discussion. 
Historians have identified a process that the historian Craig Kozlowski calls the nocturnalization of public life, of public culture, tracing it back in some cases to the process of industrialization, in other cases to the early modern period. There are also people in, from classical antiquity who study the same process. Um, historians have shown that as researchers, we might usefully see the night as a legal and a cultural concept as independent from the notion of darkness. Mm -hmm. The threshold between day and night forms a sort of a frontier zone, in the words of one historian, beyond which people seek opportunities for social advancement, wealth, and the, and the evasion of surveillance and social constraints. Others, talk about the nighttime as a period of fear and danger. For some, it's a time that presents opportunities for freedom and liberation from diurnal restrictions and routines. Nightologists have shown that the distinction between day and night have work to do other than just to acknowledge variations in light and the ability to discern cultural details about people and danger in public spaces. The nighttime was, in other words, constructed to regulate work and to control both to control and protect workers, and as I myself argue, as a governance strategy that fills in at the municipal level where national laws can't reach. The urban architecture of daily time included material things, literally architecture, doors, locks, church bells, public clocks, and of course, public illumination. But the architecture of night also encompassed architecture in a more figurative sense. The night was composed of laws, rules, and policing practices that grew in tandem with the modern city itself. So yeah, that's a good slide, thank you. <laughs> You're way ahead of me. <laughs> um, so my research, um, in the context that I study, the night was actively and even aggressively defined. How did Rio accommodate the need for daily or nightly rest for the city's enslaved workers who were legally prohibited from living on their own and who were prohibited from being out in public after the evening church bells and for whom there was usually no dedicated dwelling space in which to take their nightly rest or their daily rest? How can we study the history of sleep and rest when these had to be improvised and seized through the occupation of spaces intended for other uses. And I think it's worth mentioning here, I'll come back to this when I look at sources, that I came to this research as a historian of crime, seeking to understand what I've called in my other work before this as well, the criminalization of everyday life, as I've studied things like the early um, informal economy, and in my previous book, a, 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 the clandestine lottery that became illegal and yet one of the most important features of public life in urban Brazil. And I depend heavily on the sources generated from the police repression of a population that was almost uniformly illiterate and left no first person accounts of their experiences. So this presents an obvious kind of dilemma and, and I think a really interesting and productive one to think about in documenting the history of night. Again, I'll get back to that in a minute. First, I just would like to briefly go, um, go through this curfew that I mentioned before. So about five and a half million slaves were trafficked to Brazil between 1501 and 1850 when the slave trade ended. Um, this, this accounted for about 38% of the total slave traffic in the Americas, to the Americas. In 1821, just on the eve of Brazil's independence from Portugal, fully 46% of the population of the Brazilian capital city of Rio was enslaved, 46%. Brazil, as a Portuguese colony, had become thoroughly addicted to the forced labor of captive Africans and their descendants. And when Brazil became independent, slavery endured the legal and political transit transition in pretty much unaltered form. And it lasted until 1888 in Brazil. Um, and so can you pass to the next slide, please? So this is, this is an image by the French um, artist and traveler Debray, who 
paint it. He, he produced a lot of the visual culture that we have of everyday life in Rio. This is someone lighting a, one of the, the lanterns. So <clears throat> in post-independence, Brazil in the 1824 constitution, masters property rights. This is a liberal 19th century sense of liberal constitution that held um, property rights as one of its central tenets and it provided no explicit rules for dealing with the enslaved. So it maintained slavery without ever using that word. Uh, the governance of slavery was implicitly up to propri proprietary private jurisdiction of the masters, for example, um, and also municipal ordinances and the criminal law. And so it was under these circumstances that the agent distinction between day and night made its way into everyday policing practices, eventually in the form of curfews that came to take hold in most, if not all Brazilian cities, although I, it hasn't really been studied yet everywhere, so I'm collecting documentation on it. But Rio's police chief issued new policing rec regulations in an edict published in 1825 and instituted what would become as far as I've seen, one of the longest continuously uh, functioning curfews that I've seen. It went on for about 50, for 56 years without, in an un, for an unbroken period. And the curfew, um, it only meant, it only applied to enslaved people and implicitly to free persons of African descent, and then on occasion to foreigners and lighter skinned and the well-off were explicitly exempted from this, from this regulation. So it was, as I said, it was implemented in 1825, and then by the police commander at the time, future police commanders over those many decades to follow would tweak it a little bit. They changed the hours, they changed exactly who it applied to, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't eradicated. It, it didn't end until 1878. Um, captive laborers routinely found themselves on the streets after dark, doing their master's bidding and dumping household waste, drawing water, delivering messages and objects, and ironically enough, tending to the oil and then the gas lanterns that had to be lit and, and extinguished each night after the curfew bells had already told. That, that's a, an image that demonstrates that. In other words, it was enslaved people that were sent out into the streets after dark to light the, the lanterns and then to extinguish them. Um, I can, can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, that's that's the police chief, the, the police, the head of the police who implemented the curfew, and that's a picture of the church still standing there, although the rest of the city around it is very different, where the bells were tolled. Could you please pass it to the next slide? That that shows the two places in the city center that told the bells. So it was really only in the very the most tightly um populated parts of the city that you could actually even hear the church bells. So despite this curfew, Rio's streets were not empty after dark. During this period, artificial illumination made after dark mobility in the city's public spaces a normal part of urban life. It was because of, and not in spite of, this nighttime mobility that fears of the enslaved, moving around the city, blending in with the crowd, created a perceived crisis. And there was, a, this the whole entire 19th century was distinct, was really marked by fear of uprisings and fear of fugitives. Um, and this was among the slave only classes, but among the, the police institute, all of the police officers and the people who ran the city in general. So in short, the curfew only functioned because of its exemptions and it's, it's exceptions and its exemptions and it did not correspond with cycles of light and dark. It was fully a human um, conception. So my study of the urban nighttime is a study of the curfew. This is because of the availability of documents. Mm. There's really no other way to study the urban nighttime in a thorough, in a thorough way. And I would like to raise here the eternal question asked by historians of crime in general, which is what do we do when most or even all of the documents that we're using come from a process of criminalization? Mm -hmm. How do we understand when these, when the documents come out of not the totality of what people do, but their occasional encounters with repressive 
police or in, in other contexts, perhaps the military, um, private militias and so on. And an even more difficult question is, where do we look for documentation of the most private and intimate aspects of life when the state only paid attention to what happened in public? This is the question that I have, that I grapple with when I'm trying to understand not only what the police told people to do after dark, but what they actually did, and again where they um, where they stole their moments of rest and repose. Particularly, I'm referring here to the enslaved. The history of sleep and rest in 19th century Rio has been pretty much lost in time. Source, the sources on 19th century Rio do show some sort, some of the unplanned uses of the city's quarries, warehouses, back alleys, gardens, the spaces underneath the counter of a dry goods store and hotel hallways, to name a few. Um, we find some insight in the curious asides uttered by foreign travelers about the strange places where they found slaves taking their rest, in some cases, in other cases, the indignant orders by police to arrest them. So for I have a couple of examples here that I probably don't have time to read out in full, but they're they're very kind of colorful and interesting. One was where a traveler from Prashta visiting Rio in 1819. Um, was staying in the city's first hotel, which was very underpopulated because of the curfew. There were very few foreign travelers who could even legally disembark from their boats. So they would park their boats and whether they were merchants or whether they were from foreign navies, they would have to sleep on their boats. And there was pretty, um, it's a pretty severe police repression of sailors and merchants who tried to stay on shore after nightfall. And so this, this traveler from Prussia was surprised to find in the hotel, and I quote, I fell on, I, he was walking through the hall at night, and I fell on two creatures lying on the ground. I heard the clang of a heavy chain. The next day he confronted the pension's owner and was informed that, quote, he had, that there were two slaves who had been chained at night to the hotel corridor to prevent them from moving away. So, Hence, we know that enslaved people slept in the chain in the hotel corridor. There was no other reference to this or no other place it would have left a mark in the doc in any historical document anymore. Just to give you an example, um, one has to really stumble across this information. Um, mostly, we know about what happened at night, as we said, because of the existence of documents, of documents generated by the police. Um, one other example I found just to give you a flavor for this is that in, in 1824, the commander of the Royal Guard of the Police, which was an early military police corps in Brazil, um, communicated with the judge that in a rock quarry just outside the city center, quote, there is a large number of runaway slaves who, with the consent of the person in charge there, sleep there every night. And then he he demands that a police escort go and basically arrest everyone, get grab the enslaved people and arrest whoever was complicit. So interestingly, this quarry, this rock quarry that served as a nighttime refuge for many runaway slaves, was also very connected with the growth of the city. And granite extracted from this quarry became the stones that paved the streets that were used to create the city's public fountains where enslaved people wash their clothes every day. Mm -hmm. um, the stones from here were also used to construct the church in the 18th century, uh, San Francisco de Paula that I just showed you, which was the tower where the city's two bells that sound, whose sound demarcated the curfew were rung from. So um, as a legal historian, these research questions that I ask related, that are related to the criminalization of everyday life, as I said, reappear here in a really emphatic way. And for the purpose of this group, um, of course, I'm not researching the context of war. And in fact, Brazil, as an aside, I can say presents a really interesting counterpoint because this Brazil's history is characterized by a series of unusually peaceful transitions. 
the very um, the conquest of Brazil has was nothing like the conquest of Spanish America. It was done by the kind of slow grind of, of colonial violence rather than spectacular wars like as, as happened in Spanish America for the most part. So was the decolonization process. There was only one small military engagement in Northeastern Brazil. Otherwise it was a peaceful transition to a parliamentary monarchy. So was the abolition of slavery. So was the end of constitutional monarchy in 1889 and the coups that brought down the Vargas presidency and the military dictatorship um, tanks peacefully rolled in in, in 1964 <laughs> and toppled the democratically, I know, topic the democratic, toppled the democratically elected government, replacing it by a military civilian um, dictatorship that would last through the 1980s. And then dictatorship itself ended peacefully in the 1980s. Yet as historians have now come to, to know very well, the social and political relations that I examine here unfold in the context of relentless violence, the relentless violence of slavery, and all of these supposedly peaceful transitions are, um, are considerably less peaceful when one thinks about the larger context as well. Again, something that we can talk more about um, so some I I just created some slides because again, um, can you back up just to, to the document? Thank you. Yeah, just there are some examples of some how concise these documents are that report on so and so, you know, the police captain so and so would like to report on a nighttime incident that unfolded in front of X Tavern. Um, in this case, it was the tavern in the Bolongo area of the city, which was actually where the um, the the slave market was located. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to read them out to you. They're very very concise, and they're they're compiled in these books of of the everyday occurrences of the very mundane, mostly occurrences of you know a dead horse was found on this street, or this person stole a chicken. And it's it's fascinating research, but it's really it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. Yeah. But there are a bunch of needles. <laughs> there really are. Um, so these are there are rare rare glimpses of enslaved workers trying to seize mom moments of respite or evade captivity altogether, and they survived because they, they took place out of doors. Most of Rio's enslaved residents in the decades after independence. As I said, they took their rest in places that were not designed as such. Um, and we know about them because they were in the alleyways or in this hotel, for example, but in the interior spaces of homes and households, um, the documents that might have allowed us to detail of people's daily acts, this is a, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, um, are really outside what was documented by the police. And I can just very briefly say that it, this, the eminent property, the, the regard for property rights in 19th century Brazil was such that the threshold of the, of the, the inviability of the, of the domicile, the inviability of the private, the inviolability of the private home was, was respected um, and the traditional authority of the father within the home reign supreme and so what went inside the, without inside the household was the domain of patriarchal privilege mm -hmm. and only under very narrowly defined circumstances even could police walk into a house and arrest someone and so police records municipal ordinances and administrative documents were really silent when it came to what was going on inside the home the socio-legal night that i write about here was really a function of 19th century Brazil's liberal legal regime. And in urban Brazil, the threshold of the house was both an architectural detail and a powerful legal abstraction. By night, it demarcated the outer boundaries of those who were subject to the curfew. And just briefly, this drawing that you see is not a contemporaneous drawing. It is a reconstruction of that was an illustration in the Brazilian sociologist Gilberto Freire's book called The Mansions and the Shanties about the transition to urban life. He wrote it in the 1930s, but it was about the 19th century. He pioneered 
although much of what he wrote about has been kind of debunked and he's associated with the myth of racial democracy, but he really did this incredibly loving, as an anthropologist and sociologist, the loving archival reconstruction of everyday Brazilian life using recipes and travel accounts and some archival mm -hmm. material. And he describes in with great spatial detail what mm -hmm. went on within the house, like how rooms were lit and so on. And so this was a um, an urban, you know, mansion, a well-off family's house, obviously. And if you can pass on to the next slide, it'll show you the detail of the sort of afterthought of where enslaved people were sort of hanging out in the ground floor. And so, you know, unlike in rural, in very large rural landed estates, there were actually physical structures and shacks where enslaved people were meant to sleep, but there were very, very little architecturally specific dedicated spaces for enslaved people to sleep in the house. But again, this is sort of like a, the black mm -hmm. box and of the law. We just don't really know mm -hmm. because people weren't arrested. It was, un, it was largely unremarked on. Mm -hmm. um, so just a few words of conclusion. So um, as a history of the present, and I also think of my work in, that, in, in those terms, um, curfews and the impositions of martial law and of states of siege have really become normal parts of cycles of policing and violence in cities all throughout the world through the 20th century as well. And even though in my particular case that I studied, the curfew ended, as I said, in the 18, late 1870s, but there was a state of siege imposed during um, general strikes in the 19-teens, for example, when curfews were imposed again and again throughout the, the next 20 years or more. Um, it, it seems normal, right? Uh, we humans don't see that well in the dark. And fears of darkness seem primal and biologically and astronomically determined. And curfews are generally considered to be mechanistically applied if ham-fisted policing solutions, maybe obvious policing solutions to public order crises, let business go on as normal during the day, but at night everyone has to be shut in. There's also been, interestingly, a bunch of um, very, uh, very compelling and, and moving public history, uh, oral histories as well about curfews that went on during the troubles in, in, in Northern Ireland. That's another site of you know, a cluster of really interesting research on this question. Mm -hmm. Rio de Janeiro was under curfew for not a month or six months or even a year, but for 53 years. It produced a paper trail that shows, although it doesn't show the totality of what people did at night, um, but it shows how both private and public disciplinary forces created the, so the socio-legal nighttime. We can't know exactly how that affected the experience of sleep and the content of meetings of dreams, but it's something that we can continue to try to find more needles and more haystacks that might illuminate. <laughs> Um, curfews, states of emergency, and states of siege continue to be a policing solution, as I said. Um, I wonder how we might think differently about curfews and states of emergency in the 21st century, if we can understand their roots as part of modern public life. And so finally, as we talk about the night and sleep as socially constructed, we should consider how to account for our analysis and an archival and research practices and understanding of the embodied experience of daily temporality of sleep and of the storytelling of the unconscious mind. And this might be a bit of a heresy for a social historian like me to say, but um, we should reflect on how historians might collaborate with public health specialists, mm -hmm. neuroscientists, endocrinologists, and other medical disciplines who examine sleep and rest as a function of human biology, because Again, that might seem like a contradiction to my earlier statement about sleep being, being socially constructed, but I don't think it is. Um, and, I, and I think that this is really interesting, all the, the medical and the psychological science, the neuroscience, this is also interestingly connected to the question of, of how memories are produced under conditions of political violence and repression. 
This field of mitology can contribute to our broader investigation into how we might study how the most private thoughts and memories of individual historical subjects, often under great duress, become part of our public culture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. The second question is shared by Masha Shakhtarovi, who is our co organizer from the text, and uh, I'm very excited uh, uh, to have. <laughs> I don't know when it works as my books like that. <laughs> and Masha will introduce our next uh, presenters, and I hope you will have a fruitful sure. time. Do you want to ask Masha? Yeah, Masha, do you want to ask Masha? No, we have Tara Bushka and yeah. Tara yeah. Marie Mor. Yeah. So we are in a long stay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, and like my colleagues this morning, I'd like to stress uh, how impressed I am at this event and what a pleasure it has been to be working. Um, so for me, directly with the Ukrainian colleagues, uh, although uh, I know I'm going to say one thing. Work with her as well. So it's uh, it's a real pleasure, scientific and confident way um, to have it here, despite the fact that we are now um, living through so many wars at the same time. That it's, yeah. it seems kind of weird to be discussing these topics when everyone's mind is either somewhere in Ukraine or uh, somewhere in um, Israel. Hmm? Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. So, but so thank you very much, especially in this time to be uh, to be here and to be having this discussion. Uh, so I'll uh, just introduce this uh, first session, which just right into the, the, the key of me, uh, with the session on war and terror, uh, which with uh, two um, two historians who will uh, both be talking about the Second World War uh, in different contexts. Mm -hmm. So first, let me do introduce Natalia uh, Dijuko uh, from Rundus. She's a professor of uh, Holocaust studies at the University of Florida. Uh, also, that's a very good place to be. Mm -hmm. uh, no comments. <laughs> so Natalia is one of those uh, colleagues here who passed her mind in. Um, in the worst places right now in our region of the world. Uh, she is an outstanding historian of the Holocaust, as many of you mm -hmm. know. She has uh, done offensive work both on, uh, so mainly on the uh, um, Jewish Polish historians uh, and uh, in the history of Polish Jewry, Polish Zionism, uh, but she's been also working on. Um, as I understand correctly, a second project that is, which, with which I'm most familiar with, uh, her uh, amazing project on uh, strategies of survival uh, of uh, Jews, especially in Galicia and Western Ukraine, uh, strategies of hiding, uh, and the microsocial uh, history of uh, cultural bonds, uh, community bonds, and uh, effective bonds within uh, the extreme social space of, uh, of the hiding uh, during the Holocaust. Uh, so I'll just let her um, present her work on now Jewish dreams and nightmares during the Holocaust. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, yes, it's absolutely a dream to be here um, and to have so much uh, intellectual inspiration from, from uh, especially this interdisciplinary discussion. Uh, I have a long list of books I need to order already from uh, our <laughs> Uh, first uh, set of presentations. Um, and uh, I mentioned when we met online uh, a few months ago that this is uh, wonderful for me that this project of, of a group that would work together uh, came into being because I've been uh, having on my desktop a folder uh, dreams uh, for quite a while. Uh, dropping casually things I've been coming um, upon, but with an increasing sense that uh, there's a lot that one can uh, do with it, but not quite yet having a, a sense of where I would like to take it. 
Uh, and um, I think through the lens of social history, uh, and I think that that's also why uh, for me, uh, I'm hoping uh, through these conversations, think of uh, theoretical lenses that um, would be uh, useful. And uh, as I'm still reading these uh, dreams, uh, very much uh, literally, uh, very much as a, a part of testimonies or one important trope in testimonies, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll talk about this sort of in a moment. Uh, in a way, I have the I have the uh, um, great privilege of uh, having uh, primary sources that are first person accounts. Uh, but not necessarily collections of dreams. Uh, um, so I was also somewhat jealous of, <laughs> of your, um, your product. But I want to start um, with a quote from um, uh, Ida Fink from uh, The Journey, uh, um, where she uh, records uh, one such dream moment. Um, and it's characteristic of the material I've been finding. I'll talk about it in, uh, a little bit uh, in a little bit. I was awakened by a dream. She's at this point, uh, she is on. It's, it's Ida Fink, so it's sort of memoir and novella at the same time. But knowing the story of her survival um, on Aryan papers, uh, it's likely a personal account. I was awakened by a dream, an SS man was standing over my mother's sick, sick bed. The mother died of cancer in the ghetto. Uh, the room was empty, it had been looted. I could see his face clearly. I watched him as I had been from the corner of the room where he had ordered us to stand without moving. It took uh, all of my strength to chase that image from my mind, I looked at the barred window, dawn was breaking. Right, so she is, she's no longer in a Spanish ghetto, uh, she's uh, actually uh, working uh, in Germany as a forced laborer under assumed identity, but she's in this dream going back to Spanish, going back to a moment that may or may not have happened this may be a dream and memory of, of, uh, of a um, particularly uh, traumatic moment combined. Um, and dreams in my uh, material, and as I was collecting, a, and thank you for mentioning a book that you're writing for 11 years, I, <laughs> I felt so much better that I'm not alone. I, I've, I've been collecting this material and hiding for a um, sustainable number of years. Um, and uh, so, yes, they appear in those uh, uh, dream in the in these accounts, uh, but uh, they haven't been for Eastern Europe. They haven't really been treated um, uh, enough, especially uh, by historians. And one exception is uh, Barbara Engelkin's mm. twenty thirteen. Uh, um, that wonderful article that I found very inspiring, where she, um, very similarly to me, although her training is in psychology rather than in history, where she says she's going to treat things literally uh, as literally as possible and try to find how they contribute to our knowledge about the Holocaust experience. She concentrates, she says, not on theories of dreams and their analysis or interpretations, but, uh, but on the dreams themselves, their content, influence on the dreamers and their consequences. And in fact, I share her questions, uh, but I'm also interested within the um, testimonies, uh, where these dreams show up in the testimonies and uh, what kinds of function they play in the testimonies, but also the way that the authors bring them up explaining why they bring them up. And it's particularly interesting for me when uh, the writing of the dream, um, putting down the dream uh, happens many years after the events. Uh, Ida Fink writes the journey in the 70s. Uh, some of the memoirs um, are written down in the 90s. 
Um, and of course, there is a also a methodological issue, you know, what, what story is being told in those memoirs rather than dreams. So I, uh, rather than diaries, but I've been seeing dreams uh, inserted uh, into uh, diaries as well, into the testimonies that are immediate post-war recordings uh, and uh, later uh, materials. Uh, I don't have, in Emily's uh, words, the radical insufficiency of material, but I do have uh, mostly very short and basic uh, um, mentions of dream uh, without going into details. Uh, so um, um, in terms of feelings of dream, I would even have problems applying them. <laughs> There's just a short paragraph or even, uh, even uh, less. Um, so let me share with you some of the tropes or some of the patterns that uh, I've been uh, seeing in, in those dreams. And I gave the title pressured by Bogdan to give the title. <laughs> I went for Eastern Europe because it's, you know, uh, when in doubt, say Eastern Europe. <laughs> And I, and I wonder um, about uh, place specificity, meaning how much these are dreams of um, Galicianers, dreams of Jews in Eastern Galicia, uh, how much these are dreams of Polish Jews, um, how much, uh, and in fact, um, uh, Engelkin's article uh, suggests that uh, likely um, if you where to dig in Czechoslovakia, you might find um, or you know, middle mid sized town uh, in uh, elsewhere in uh, General Guverma. This the dreams uh, and the sort of surrounding context of uh, sleep uh, might be different. Because I'm writing a book um, on hiding, um, I was particularly encounter encountering dreams in the context of hiding other people. Uh, uh, of course, were obviously dreaming before they went into hiding mm -hmm. as well. And in fact, thinking aloud in terms of uh, specificity of place, it would be wonderful to see what are the dreams of um, Galicianers under the Soviet occupation uh, for the two years before, but I haven't seen really any. So uh, one uh, element um, is that this is without a doubt moment of crisis, moment of very real uh, uh, danger, uh, um, both momentary in those um, times of roundups and searches, and also prolonged uh, as people are hiding or passing as non-Jews. So uh, one aspect of sleep um, that is shared for those people who pass as um, most of them as Poles, but also as Ukrainians or ethnic Germans because of their linguistic proficiencies, and that is specific to the region. Um, uh, and those that hide physically go underground is that sleep is a time of danger. Uh, this is when you can, you lose control over your, what you say and how you behave. And this is a moment of potential. And I'm always afraid to say this word in English because there's rapture and rapture. And I always say the, the wrong one, but uh, this break, the trap in your um, ability to stay silent, to stay mo motionless, not to mention words that would give you away. And so just give you uh, one example. And this is one of my favorite testimonies, Hannah Mandel from Zhokia, Jokfa. Uh, who is uh, hiding uh, first in the Geron Jokfa, then goes with her two daughters to hide um, on the Aryan side in Warsaw, and then returns to the area of her uh, origin to a small village uh, not far from Jokfa. So Hannah recalls that in Warsaw, and I quote, I had no peace during the day or at night. I constantly feared I would be discovered. I lived with my daughters in a tiny room. We had only one bed, but the three of us, and we couldn't fit in together. I mostly sat through the night napping. I had to watch over my children's sleep. 
so they uh, would not call for their father. They wouldn't uh, themselves uh, betray themselves with the word uttered in their sleep. So there is what Masha, when you mentioned in the discussion, this element of communal sleeping, enforced communal sleeping, and enforced watching other people sleep. Uh, and uh, numerous accounts uh, when people hide together mentioned that people would take turns on sleeping and not sleeping to uh, watch over the sleeping person um, uh, so that they would not be dangerous. But uh, the same goes for sleeping in hiding. And there was, of course, also a lack of any kind of um, privacy and physical ability to relax and, and be comfortable. And there is obviously this auditory uh, sensory issue of making sounds. Uh, um, so not only saying things, but also neutral things such as coughing uh, uh, in your sleep. And um, another incredible uh, diary from uh, Joffa, uh, Clara Schwartz, um, Kramer after the war, uh, writes in her diary uh, how she uh, and nine people hiding together, it's 18 Jews uh, hiding together, uh, she is one privilege to have a peaceful sleep. So she's allowed in the very limited space that they share. She's sleeping in this the most external part of the bunker because she's not making sounds. But the <clears throat> teenagers and children who um, are restless in their sleep are um, pushed to the most inner part of the bunker to um, minimize the, the sound that they might uh, produce. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the, the notion of uh, restless sleep, uh, of course, is also connected to what sleeping in terms of dreaming can bring. Uh, however, um, I find also um, testimonies that uh, speak to uh, sleep as uh, I thought about the uh, notion of palliative uh, um, function of sleep. And um, the most general is formulated by Adela Hinzenrat. She's uh, hiding in the uh, Hobbage. It's an amazing handwritten diary that really should be published. Um, um, she's hiding with, a, uh, with her toddler son. Uh, and she writes, um, uh, the night was our escape. So very different approach to um, the previous uh, um, perspective. At night, we could be normal people. Dreams are great equalizers. Both those free and hiding, hiding people dream. The horrible reality disappeared and blessed an awareness of our situation took its place. In the morning, a day arrived, which had to be filled with doing something. Uh, but I also want to say that it's for me, it's interesting that she makes this distinction as a night um, being the time of peace and forgetting about the horror and turning, rendering Jews normal again, um, and the day being the um, time of a great challenge because uh, a great many testimonies, um, diaries, uh, especially talk about the reversal of that day and night. And they, a lot of people write about it that we, um, that part of the dehumanization was that they had to switch and live at night mm -hmm. and sleep during the day. That the night was the time when um, some kind of activity could be taking place, um, and the day, days required complete motionless and um, and silence. Um, and um, a lot of uh, metaphoric uh, um, um, reflection on it uh, talks about how. Uh, Jews in hiding became like animals who live at night uh, and sleep during the day. So, so for me, uh, Hildenrat is really um, interesting that she preserves the distinction as it was during the before time. Um, 
And then uh, there are dreams that are positive in a sense uh, that people, you know, not because of um, the content of the dream, but uh, the understanding that people awake into. This is a trope I've seen a lot. People who are uh, hesitating what to do, whether they should go into hiding or not, escape from the ghetto or not, accept this or that possibility of rescue or rescue for uh, their family. Um, and uh, they wake up from a dream with a clarity that today is the night we're going to try to escape. Yes, we'll go to this or that peasant. And um, I would love to know if there was some kind of a sign that they interpreted from the dream, or this was this moment with which, in which somehow the emotions and the fears and, and the um, um, a sense of threat align themselves uh, to make uh, the decision. But it's certainly uh, um, in uh, enough uh, testimonies to to be seen as a drug. And, and then part of those uh, dreams that are um, part of a survival story, I was mentioning this uh, on Zoom, are uh, prophetic dreams. Uh, dreams in which uh, people receive a warning and it's um, usually through the appearance of dead relatives. Sometimes uh, relatives who uh, had peaceful natural death before the war, or sometimes recently murdered relatives. And interestingly, it's usually a grandfather or a grandmother uh, who show up in a dream, um, apropos these appearances, these visions, and uh, upon waking up, um, um, people say, you know, I understood that uh, I need to run. I understood that, that my grandfather was telling me that I need to um, leave this hiding place. And then what follows usually in the account is a reflection that indeed I heard later that this hiding place was discovered two days after uh, I left. And so I'm very much uh, puzzled, but also absolutely um, fascinated mm -hmm. by the way these prophetic dreams mm -hmm. are um, incorporated by uh, survivors into their story of you know the complete randomness of their mm -hmm. survival on the one hand and on the other hand some kind of mystical inner logic and then being often the generation of people educated in secular schools uh, sometimes university educated this is often framed as I'm, I'm a rational person. I'm not really a religious person, but I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> and I must, I don't know what to do with it either. Uh, and these are extremely many of these, uh, several of these mm. uh, dreams um, are uh, uh, featured grandfathers, for example, wrapped in a praying shawl. Uh, or um, uh, um, the dreamer understands that this is Yom Kippur, or these extremely meaningful, religiously infused with meanings and moments um, for them as Jews, but they don't seem to necessarily um, interpret the world through that lens of inner um, <laughs> lives. Uh, or at least that's how they uh, kind of yeah, it's it, they they talk about it as something that not only saved their lives, but uh, something that surprised them that uh, this would this would happen. And then uh, there is a um, whole um, um, uh, bunch of uh, of, of um, dreams that I uh, call nightmarish visions. It's a little bit like the quote from uh, the thing that I started with, but it's uh, descriptions, and I found those in Iskorbicher, in historical commissions, uh, in the immediately post-war um, um, uh, put down uh, memoirs, but like memoirs from 46, 47, 48, uh, when 
I would write, read the text several times to understand if the person is describing the reality, the dream, or some kind of a horrible, horrific vision that they have while awake. And uh, these include especially um, um, shooting sites, um, um, being um, chased through their hometown into the cemetery, being uh, uh, ordered to undress, standing um, on the edge of the pit, falling on, uh, into the bodies, uh, crawling out of the uh, mass grave, and uh, it's unclear to me um, whether th this happened or it didn't happen. Now, I think they probably do know whether they were in the mass grave or not, but they describe it in this kind of gray zone in between. Um, and I find it, uh, I find it extremely um, uh, meaningful uh, and uh, and important. Um, in terms of uh, uh, positive dreams, um, but they are very they're sort of written with ambivalence, uh, and they're all about effective bonds. And we were talking about this dreaming community. Um, on the one hand, in my um, in my material, dreaming seems to be utterly silent and lonely, a singular experience. And I will give you an example uh, again from Clara Schwartz's testimony, who and testimony diary, who writes uh, in the spring of 1944, so just a few uh, months uh, before. Uh, Jokra was uh, liberated, and this is the anniversary of her um, older daughter, older sister's um, uh, uh, death. Uh, there was a situation in the during their uh, hiding. Uh, there was a um, fire on the street, and her sister panicked. They worried that the house where the Jews, uh, eighteen people, were hiding together, that the house would catch fire as well. And her sister panicked. Ran, ran, uh, ran out, was encountered by someone who recognized her uh, tortured and uh, murdered. And so Clara, uh, on the anniversary of her death, uh, muses to her diary about her uh, sister, and then says, um, I'm dreaming about her um, all the time. Um, I, I always dream about her alive. Um, but the dream remains just a dream. I wake up and I cry, but I cry um, quietly uh, so that uh, my mother doesn't notice, uh, my mother doesn't want to talk about it, and so I'm not telling her about my dreams. Uh, and in fact, I didn't see a single testimony in the accounts of people hiding together in which they talk about their dreams. This doesn't mean that they don't. Uh, but um, there was no trope of people waking up and telling their um, hiding uh, partners, usually relatives, uh, about the dream. However, uh, um, Clara clearly takes solace um, experiencing her sister alive, but then comes the moment of realizing that this is only a dream. And this is the most common trope. Um, uh, Nelly Toll, who was uh, younger than Clara, she was born in 1935 in Hungary, uh, uh, writes in her uh, memoir repeatedly about uh, when, how when she closed her eyes and fell asleep, she had beautiful images that blossomed behind my eyelids. Um, we were all sitting together in the living room. Uh, Janek, that's her brother, Papa, and I quietly listened to Mama playing a Schubert sonata as Magda, this is the servant, walked in carrying a silver, silver, silver tray filled with pastries and bonbons, mm -hmm. comforted, I slept on. Mm -hmm. So here it's everything, right? She She's hungry. Uh, uh, she uh, is humiliated. She's terrified. And she lost all these people at, at, the, at this farm. So she dreams everything. She dreams the um, safety, the comfort, the family status, uh, all um, lost to her. And interestingly, but this is a memoir versus uh, Clara's diary. Uh, she doesn't reflect on the horror of 
waking up to realization. Rather, she really uh, remembers the the joy uh, the joy that it brought her as um, as she um, drank on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, last uh, last um, piece mm -hmm. uh, this between uh, sleep. And reality, I mentioned the uh, mass graves, um, but uh, there's a lot more uh, of the accounts, especially of uh, being discovered and uh, of the present presence of the Germans or the Ukrainian police in the bunker uh, um, and, being uh, being um, forced to leave the bunker in this moment of uh, utter fear. And uh, I found uh, several testimonies in which people describe very um, very much in detail the, the feeling, the light, the sounds uh, of, uh, of this experience, and then say, I really don't know if it happened. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I would love advice on what to do uh, with uh, that kind of um, uh, description. Um, so uh, what I find is that this is really an extremely rich material and full of uh, rupture between the secular and the religious, the, um, uh, the emotional, the, the, the collective and the, and the uh, individual. Um, and there is no single Hitler dream, by the way, um, that I've seen. These dreams seem extremely localized, extremely localized to a place, a community, a room, a bed. Um, but I will keep on digging. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am not turning this way. <laughs> Sounds scary. It's not only uh, birds, but so like we in uh, um, And uh, so, yeah, thank you very, very much for this uh, wonderful uh, and extremely rich presentation. I will just um, give the uh, floor right away to Sarah Pushka. Uh, and so, we are very happy to have her as one of our uh, postdoctor researcher, uh, researchers at the SASEC. Sarah has uh, written. A uh, wonderful dissertation, PhD dissertation on um, the blockade of Leningrad, uh, based on uh, diaries, which he uh, carefully and impressively matched. So she actually cataloged and registered all existing uh, diaries of uh, the Leningrad uh, blockade. Uh, and uh, offered this, created this an extremely um, nuanced and rich. Um, uh, rendering of uh, of this blockade beyond like beyond specific groups and beyond the against her. She's uh, currently also working. Um, she continues to work on diaries, uh, and uh, one of her projects, with Mommy Musnik, will be there tomorrow. Uh, is uh, currently on um, diaries of the Holocaust. Uh, so Sarah, I will just give you the floor. Uh, you're going back to Leningrad with dreams and plans for planning and sort of for studying the effects of starvation on the site. Thank you, Masha, and thank you all for your invitation to take part in this workshop. Uh, the topic is very inspiring, and the reason uh, I agreed to attend is not because dreams are my area of expertise. I'm not a specialist in night studies, but because during my research uh, on the subjectivity uh, during World War II, um, I was faced with dreams in my sources, and I felt they could uh, document something. Um, so it's well known that uh, violent historical uh, upheavals generally lead to a reconfiguration of dreams. For instance, after the French Revolution, a radical change in the content of dreams can be observed, uh, reflecting a trend toward politicization. Similarly, the example of dreams during the Third Reich uh, or those during the Stalinist terror demonstrate how life under a totalitarian regime makes reality traumatic. That's why uh, Walter Benjamin believes that, I quote, to portray an era is also to portray its dreams. 
with the idea that the subconscious is not a mere external witness, but uh, an engaged witness in real time. These dreams appear as true seismographs of the impact of cataclysms on the mind. They must be considered both as historical phenomenon and as a source. Reinhard Koselek, who closely examined, examined uh, dreams during the Solbrich, um, goes further, stating that dreams, I quote, bear witness to a past reality in a way that perhaps no other source can surpass. Why? Because they deliver messages that sometimes cannot be grasped by ordinary representations of the real world. And when they refer to particularly violent situations, they can potentially compensate for an uh, individual's failure to verbalize their experiences. We can provide the example of the philologist Lydia Chukovskaya, a friend of Anna Akhmatova. Uh, her dreams from the, the time of the Great Terror mainly contained uh, 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 diaries, sorry, the diaries from the Stalinist uh, terror mainly contained dreams. And she explains this by the fact that reality exceeded power of description. During my research, I became interested in dreams when I was exploring the impact of famine on people in the context of war and siege, the one uh, endured by Leningrad by the Nazis between uh, 1941 and 1944. To be short, this was a period of confinement, bombings, extreme shortages, and massive deaths. Nearly a million civilians died during these two and a half years of decades. During the first winter, 41-42, uh, the population was deprived of uh, running water, electricity, transport, and lived in darkness, cold, hunger, and constant struggle, struggle for survival. To understand the, uh, the essence of the besieged experience, I relied on the purpose of several dozen diaries that have been unearthed in the last three decades. They reveal the extent of, uh, to which famine invaded every aspect of existence, from the body to the mind, from uh, social communication, interaction, to uh, temporality and space, <coughs> and even uh, language itself. The sensation of hunger is all powerful, overwhelming, and offers no respite to the besieged people. So at this point, I wondered, what about dreams? What is happening is in the subconscious? What can dreams tell us about the grip of famine? And more broadly, to quote a question asked by uh, Sharon Slivinsky in her book, Dreaming, Dreaming in Dark Times, uh, what do dreams manage to say or show about human experience that is not legible otherwise. I had a privileged source uh, for studying these dreams, diaries, where their authors record their dreams in real time. So before turning to the, the dreams of the Leningraders, um, I just want to provide some precisions. Um, the first is contextual. Actually, it was this morning's presentations, and especially uh, Amy Chesel, uh, that made me think that I should uh, specify um, the, the dreamer's natural environment. First, um, sleep is not an intimate moment, as uh, Masha pointed out earlier, because the writers generally sleep um, several people, not only in the same room, due to the fact that they live uh, in a communal paths, but also in the same bed to keep warm each other. Um, second, as it often or maybe uh, always the case in times of war, night in besieged Leningrad is not a quiet, peaceful, restful time because bombings can occur at any time. People sleep. Uh, on the left, they know that they could be uh, violently awakened at any second. They must be ready to quickly get dressed and run to the air raid shelter. <clears throat> so night is a time of anxiety. 
Uh, second clarification is uh, rather methodological. Uh, I just, just to be clear, I do not claim today to give a complete uh, picture of dreams in BCG Leningrad. First, I haven't carried out an exhaustive uh, study of dreams, nor I have I, uh, attempted to catalog them systematically in the diaries, but it's something that can be done. <laughs> Second, we only know the dreams that some Leningraders chose to record, recount. And those who uh, kept diaries do not necessarily represent the entire besieged population, of course. I have selected, selected um, the dreams recorded during the height of the famine, when most inhabitants received only uh, 124 grams of bread per day. After three months of blockade, we can notice that the uh, variety of dreams is narrowing and that there is a kind of standardization. Not surprisingly, the dreams of the besieged Leningraders are almost exclusively about food. Unlike, unlike dreams from the, the 30s, which often had political content. In this sense, uh, there are a continuation of waking life. Uh, so day and night, the besieged Leningraders mainly think about food. There are two types of dreams related to food. One, uh, most often, these dreams compensate compensate for the lack for the life by repeatedly and compulsively depicting abundance. This echoes what Primo Levi called the Tantalus dream. Here are some examples from uh, various uh, diaries. My brother dreams of trucks full of cakes or bread. I often dream of a table filled with appetizers. <laughs> Every night I dream of bread, butter, cakes, and potatoes. <clears throat> One diarist is surprised by scenarios that are far from realistic. For instance, she, who had never known how to cook, dreams of preparing various good meals. <clears throat> how to interpret these dreams? Um, I think there are at least two interpretations for this type of dreams. The first most intuitive interpretation is to see them as a sign that famine is attacking the inner self, that it is tracking individual psyches. Everything that has been repressed during the day resurfaces, breaking down the resistance systems built by the people. For example, a diarist is proud of her persistent ability to push away food obsession during waking hours. But then, when she realizes that uh, she dreams only of food, she admits that she loses the battle in her sleep. This is probably uh, why, according to another diarist, this submersion of hunger into the dream space constitutes the best definition of the starving condition and one of the stages leading to death. Conversely, for another diarist, the fact that she, is no, she no longer dreams of food is precisely what leads her to believe in the beginning of her I'm so solid. Is it by itself? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Well, maybe it just was not connected. The red light is on. Yeah. Uh, so, however, another interpretation uh, can be proposed based on a uh, Freudian uh, hypothesis. The dream of abundance is not necessarily or exclusively a reflection of the inv invasive and de devastating effects of famine. 
considering the subconscious as the first of the resistance, the dream of abundance can be seen as a way to block hunger from accessing the deeps of the self. After all, it's not a nightmare. The dream provides the only opportunity in the context of famine to eat, to enjoy abundance and produce long gone from the besieged city. Temporarily, the individual satisfies his or her desire, virtually, suspending the feeling of hunger that constantly torments him or her. In doing so, they sustain a life drive, they do not surrender. And this is very crucial for the individual's integrity and self appreciation. In a way, dreams make it possible to reconnect with the non starved self, the one that is no longer burdened by constant concerns about livelihood, survival. Thus, it partially restores the self shattered by the ordeals of the blockade. The dreamer is no longer persecuted, he becomes a conqueror. In that respect, dreams offered a rare opportunity to recover a sense of agency. Um, so the dream can be seen as a form of underground resistance organized by the psyche, a mechanism of self-defense, and what uh, Jean Carroll called a means of safeguard when analyzing dreams in concentration camp. The psyche digs deep within itself to create a shelter, which perhaps will help it to cope with the real world. In the morning, the besieged Leningraders share the nocturnal feasts, extending the presence of food before returning to the sad reality of scarcity. But there can, be, uh, there can be a backlash to this kind of dreams. Sometimes uh, these dreams orgies become torturous upon waking. The starveling writer returns abruptly to a reality of famine that he wished was just a bad dream. This shift leads to reaction of disappointment and anger. anger. This is precisely the paradox that governs many concentration camp dreams, the one that makes the fulfillment of desire the very element of the unbearable. To limit frustration, some people set up what might be called dream self-censorship, a technique that can be found in besieged Leningrad as well as in the concentration camp. So they decide to not uh, recount their dreams in, in the morning. <clears throat> the second type of food related dreams is, in fact, a nightmare. It's when, even in dreams, there is no food left. And here we can clearly say that famine pervades the dream as an expression of real life, sometimes even exacerbated. There is no more conversation, no respite. The last barrier collapses. Such so dreams can intensify the anxiety. I quote uh, a diarist, I dream at times of the increase in bread rationing, rationing at other times uh, that I get no bread at all, at times that there is no more room in the line, in the line. It's all about food. No more, no more place in the line. The dreamer is, co is constantly brought back to his condition of starvation. Mm -hmm. The subconscious dangerously seems to be a space for desire fulfillment, but, but it's threatened by a traumatic reality. When the dream is no longer a, a refuge, a fortified territory, but instead becomes a place where the lack is renewed, the will is frustrated and fulfillment is prevented, the besieged people have no way out, which leads to the risk of mental and physical imprisonment in fact. So we see that the dreams of the besieged linguists are key witnesses to the grip of hunger, sometimes seeing uh, signs of inner uh, guerrilla war, 
and sometimes symptoms of subjugation or even capitulation. I would like to end my presentation with another type of dream, one not related to food, but to another fundamental aspect of the study of mass violence, transmission. This time, I will focus on a specific concrete dream that musician Lev Margulis had after the winter 41-42. Uh, he dreamt that back home after the siege, he began to recount uh, the blockade in all his, its terrible aspects. But his listeners rejected him. I quote, everyone had enough of my, of my account, accounts of Leningrad horrors. They all turned away from me, refusing to listen. We are familiar with this type of dream scenario uh, that depicts the failure of transmission of the sharing of a traumatic experience in concentration camp context. In Auschwitz, Primo Levi had a dream very similar to Margulis's. On his return home, Levi starts to tell the story of the camps, evoking the hunger and violence. But the reaction is exactly the same as for Margulis. I quote Levi, it is in vain. I realize that my listeners do not follow me. They are entirely indifferent. My sister looks at me, gets up, and leaves without a word. In both dreams, the witness faces rejection from their interlocutors, who <coughs> physically distance themselves and turn away, leaving the dreamer isolated with their inaudible suffering. <coughs> and these are not just people, any people, but their close ones their family, those who should be the most receptive to their story, the most capable of sharing it and enabling their its transmission. Primo Levi stated that it was a recurrent dream among prisoners. <clears throat> I quote, I, we all, had dreamed something like this during Auschwitz nights, speaking and not being heard, regaining freedom, but remaining alone. It's also a prophetic dream because it foreshadows what will actually happen to most of them. Right? The end of Margulis' dream speaks for itself. I quote, I drowned in a swamp. So the impossibility of communicating one's experience of being heard leads to the uh, annihilation of the witness itself. To conclude very short, uh, briefly, this dream symptomatizes the terrible violence of the blockade, the deepen our understanding of the intimate experience of siege and starvation. More broadly, that shows the value of these sources for research on the war and the necessity to deepen methodological reflections mm -hmm. on how dreams can be analyzed and worked with especially in the context of traumatic events. The similarity of dreams, which are underlined across different traumatic experiences, blockade camps, suggest connections, uh, transnational, transpatient connection worth exploring, and implies the existence of a, a kind of reservoir of shared dreams during times of upheaval. <coughs> Thank you for the <laughs>